All Bite and No Bark. Written by Currently Caffeinated. Dubbed by Melberry Stars. Summary. Midoriya Izuku was born quirkless. Just because he has a quirk now doesn't mean his body still isn't built like someone who's quirkless. He still has a double pinky toe. He still has the other parts of his body that develop just as slowly as his ancestors did. So what happens when he gets put into a situation where he uses these underdeveloped traits? Or Midori Izuku bites someone. Chapter 1. Main Story There were a few small details about quirkless people that were mostly unknown due to the rarity of quirkless children in this generation. The existence of quirks had sped up the evolutionary process of a human body to accommodate their existence. So things that humans had spent centuries slowly growing out has been expedited. For the quirkless, this process remains at a slow pace for their ancestors. Izuku knows that his jaw is slightly larger than his quirk counterparts. A necessity for wisdom teeth, the slit in his mouth waiting to become a nuisance. There's still a random organ in his body that could promptly explode whenever the opportune moment arrives. He has a quirk. It's his quirk now, All Might said so, but that still doesn't magically change his biology. His pinky toe won't suddenly become a single toe joint instead of two when he wakes up in the morning, which is why his feet are wider compared to others. Why is this information relevant? Well, that can be explained by looking back on the day that shall not be discussed that happened during summer break between the second and third years at UA. Groaning, Izuku snapped awake to silence his obnoxious alarm as it berated his eardrums in warning. The constant scream of time to wake up from his all night themed alarm clock was starting to grate on his nerves the longer he tried to avoid it. He knew right then and there that today was going to be a bad day. Normally, Izuku was excited to wake up on these mornings. He loved going for jogs as the sun rises and colors the sky with pale blues as the crisp breeze cools his heated skin from exertion. Coming back to the dorms to take a shower and then head downstairs for breakfast provided by whoever was scheduled that day. Chats with friends. He has friends now and just enjoy the day. His alarm was usually a neutral object, one that he didn't usually mind. So to wake up and immediately feel the need to curse the world after opening heavy lids is just a beacon of wrong. Sighing, he got out of bed with a reluctant and bit of vertigo due to the growth spurt he was going through. One Yagi Sant had warned him about. One for all, adjust to the bodies that hold it and make it to the necessary changes to house the cork properly. Which is why, despite being projected to stop at 6 foot 5 inches, Yagi was over seven fucking feet tall and headed downstairs to the common area with his running shoes. They're red, bright colors, an eyesore that he loves. Not that he had a choice in the color anyways. The quick morning run had been pleasant enough. Yu Wei was always quiet during the summer break, considering the lack of students in the halls. And the trails between these trees were pretty. So his mood had been brightened considerably, compared to when he had awoken. Though there still was a tenseness to his shoulders that will probably stay there all day, only to relax when he's passed out later that night. For now, he does what he does best and plasters on a bright, fake smile and heads into the common room after getting dressed from a shower. Ah, Mido! Cheers a familiar voice, and Izuku turns to see Ashido sitting at the dining room table. Ah, it was Kachan's turn to cook that day. Good morning, Mina. Izuku chirped. Slipping into the kitchen, he caught a sight of Kachan standing above the stove. Several different foods were being cooked, but based on the smell and pancake, he was going American style this morning. He had got a quick one over from the blonde before Kachan huffed. I'll be ready in a couple minutes, nerd. Now out of my fucking kitchen. He punctuated his statement with a glare, which Izuku almost teared up after since he realized that it wasn't malicious anymore. Yue had done wonders in helping patch up their very complicated and strained relationship. Breakfast had passed relatively quickly and was delicious as always. Most of his classmates had come down to eat and discuss what they should do. Kaminari had loudly stated that they should 
all head out for a group trip to the arcade or similar places. Izuku felt justifiably hesitant to go out on a group trip, considering the last time he did, Shigaraki had strangled him. Izuku wasn't into being choked. Did he share this opinion? Absolutely not. Anxiety and his martyr complex says no. Thank you very much. Yes, he was in therapy. Yes, it was slowly working, but old habits die hard. Plus, bad days just help push his old mindset. Just that a little bit closer to the front, and he'd find himself sitting into old habits even easier. So the class decided they wanted to go out that day, to the open street market that had fair games and an arcade so that they could have fun and grab any fun things they want. Getting Aizawa on board was left up to Koda and Choji since, and he quotes Ochako on this, You have the most say, and we can't use Midoriya since problem child and out of your way never really goes well. Izuku swears that Ochako jinxed him, and if so, he was so going to put salt in her coffee for a week. So that's how he found himself staring out over the booths in the street. Aizawa sends a looming self right behind him. Anytime he looks back, all he gets is a raised eyebrow that perfectly conveys, you can't be trusted alone outside of Yue without running into some kind of villain. So I'm not going anywhere, problem child. Which, fair, but he was still going to give an exasperated glance back to show that that really wasn't necessary. As he walks over to the arcade, following after the Deku Squad, he gets a distinct feeling that the universe is laughing at him. The arcade was fun. He kind of sucked on the dance and rhythm games, but he got first in air hockey tournaments of the death and claw machines, though that wasn't really ranked. Ochako had gone slightly feral on the pinball machines, and Shoto was dryly commenting about the entire time, which was incredibly amusing. The Baku squad was having the time of their lives in the laser tag room. Their chaotic war cries could be heard echoing in the arcade and Koda was decimating anyone who tried to challenge him on the fighter games, which was rather shocking. Aizawa, at some point, had actually joined in on the fun and won every single game he played. It was surprising at first, until he remembered how competitive Aizawa really was. The only thing that the man couldn't win was the claw machine, which made Izuku smugly proud of his abilities. It's safe to say that Izuku was having the time of his life. So... Of course, that's when it went all to shit. He cursed that he managed to grab the nearby children and dodged the incoming blast aimed in their direction. Jumping out onto the street and past the barricade in line, the police had managed to erect in the short time since the start of the attack. He inwardly thanked his paranoia that had him bring his provisional license as he passed the kids off to some officers that double-checked the plastic card that made his cork use legal. It wasn't as if his face wasn't relatively known, which, due to the numerous villain attacks that plastered his face on the news every other week, and should have clued him in immediately. No, not at all. Aizawa sensei was hanging back and helped civilians evacuate and directed his classmates to do the same. The villains were being engaged by a few heroes that had been nearby. He vaguely recognized a few, and a good chunk were newbies and the nearby building was crumbling under the force of the villain attack. Some kind of earthquake, or systemic quirk, which is so cool, and honestly, a waste. His classmates were scarily efficient, especially under their homeroom teacher. So soon, all of the surrounding civilians were safely behind barricades. Izuku was doing a double check of the perimeter when he heard a trapped yell for help. Springing into action, he jumped through the already shattered open window, and rolled through what used to be the arcade, and which was now a post-apocalypse map. He scanned the room before catching sight of a faint green hue from behind the ticket counter. Vaulting over scattered machines and finally at the counter, Izuku crouched down and locked eyes with a teary-eyed teen employee before he smiled. It's all right, come, I'll get you out of here, okay? He asked softly. The employee nodded frantically and reached out with a trembling hand to grab on. Gently, Izuku swung his arms underneath the teen's legs as he brought the other arm around his shoulders before placing it under their back, lifting the teen up into a quick movement before he dashed out of the building. He was still heading over to the barricades when he heard a strange noise. It sounded like a really creepy chuckle and, 
Oh, fuck, I'm gently with a chainsaw, really? This cliche bullshit. The previously dubbed employee teen, who was now being bestowed with name Asshole 2, the number one being a dev whore, was now holding a knife to his throat. How did he miss this important detail? He'll never know. He does. However, blame his shitty day. Now be a good little hero and place me down gently and keep your hands where I can see him afterwards. Complying, while holding back a frustrated huff, Izuku placed the teen asshole too on the ground before raising his hands, much like someone getting arrested would. A quick scan over the now gasping heroes who had caught sight of the situation let him see the exact moment Aizawa's face contorted from focused to resigned and determined and worried. It would have been a beautiful display of skill how fast Aizawa could prioritize if it wasn't for the knife pressed against his throat. He was roughly guided towards the center of oddly still chaos of the scene, a stillness caught by a hostage situation his brain supplied. As his captor yelled something to the now conflicted group of law enforcement and skittish newbie heroes, he had long since tuned the asshole out. He kept his head tilted down, breathing slow and steady as he calmly repressed the freak out his brain wanted to have. His face was probably looking worryingly blank right now, but he'll deal with that breakdown later, when he's not being held at knife point. Minutes passed, and Izuku was aware enough to know that asshole too was demanding his friends to be freed, and some money probably, along with safe passage that he was probably going to be dragged along with to keep. But he was rather done with this whole situation, so he was only vaguely paying attention. That's kind of when things slightly got worse. And to this day, no one knows whether they could claim that it was only for the villains involved. Asshole 2 had started shouting angrily, body tense and shaking. Then they started gesturing wildly with a non-knife holding hand. This had the fortunate, or unfortunate, side effect of causing the knife to be jerked away from his neck by a half a foot. The timing was impeccable, really. Izuku will to this day claim that his next actions were justified if a bit brutal. The rest of his classmates just deadpan at him every time. With a wild gesture that brought his non-knife left hand closer to his face, Izuku was struck by a sudden and intense urge that he had acted upon the moment it sparked his brain. Hundreds of times being told to take every opportunity you can and fight by Aizawa, had been drilled, react on instinct, and nothing too far with your life on the line, into his head. He had leaned forward towards the offending limb, opened his mouth, and bit the bastard's hand. Now let's take a moment to remember the beginning of this story. You know, the part where it was explained that Izuku has a larger jaw than quirked people due to his wisdom teeth. Well, his larger jaw also comes with the added effect of being stronger, the most of the quirk people. Now, do you also remember that vague fact that was also tossed around the internet for a while? The one about how the strength of your jaw is actually a lot more impressive than you think? That also described a certain action being as easy as biting carrots. If so, then what happened really shouldn't come as a surprise. Izuku bit the bastard's finger, fueled by adrenaline and pure feral energy, driven by his current mindset being geared for survival. What he didn't expect was to bite two of the fingers on the non-knife hand, clean, off, with a crunch that had cemented his new distaste for carrots, for the foreseeable future. Jumping out of the asshole's hold, he dashed over to the barricade with one frawl sparking and snapped around him like an electric shield. The scene erupted into chaos the minute the howls of the man, who had just had his fucking fingers bitten off, reached his ears. Izuku ran until he was forced to stop by two warm hands on his shoulders, and his quirk was cut off in a way that was steadily becoming an instantaneous way to recognize Aizawa's presence. Finally letting himself calm down enough to feel the fingers still in his fucking mouth, he spat the offending appendages out with a few more coughs to get rid of the excess blood, while leaning heavily into the sturdy warmth of his homeworn teacher. He was mortified by this later, but for now, expelling the disgusting taste in his mouth was much more important concern. He felt a solid bump against his back as Aizawa helped him get through the worst of it. 
another thing to be horrified and embarrassed about later. Before a solid palm in his head brought his attention up to me, Aizawa's gaze. Izuku was almost sent choking again, but this time from emotion. He saw pride gleaming in his teacher's eyes. Good fucking job, problem child, Aizawa firmly praised. There's no such thing as fighting dirty, just... <coughs> just fighting to survive, Izuku finished. A small smile that was probably coming out across more as a grimace made its way on his face. He did feel slightly better about chomping on the guy's fingers off now. Aizawa was weirdly good at doing that despite his despising emotional situation. He was brought out of his musing by his warm and gently guiding him towards the nearest EMT. He was ready to be cleared, go home into the dorms, take a shower, and fall asleep for a small coma, and deal with all the incoming breakdowns tomorrow. Hound Dog was probably going to get a kick out of this during their session on Monday. Both of them were too caught up in their mission to get to the nearest medic and really notice the terrified looks on the nearby police officers' faces. Chapter 2. Extra chapter for those who asked. The ride back to the dorms of UA was completely silent. The soon-to-be class 3A were too shocked, or maybe dumbfounded would suit their current state better, to make much conversation on the train ride home. Their brains played the last four hours on a constant loop with crystal clear quality in their heads. Midoriya, their sweet, adorable, sunshine-personified, innocent Midoriya, was currently passed out on their teacher's shoulder as the man kept his eyes cracked open for any potential threats. The teen had passed out the second the train had begun to move, so they were left stewing in their brains as millions of questions begged to be asked despite none of them wanting answers. What do you even start with when confronting with what they saw just mere minutes ago? They'd gone out for fun to relax after a stressful week as heroes in training. They should have known something would have happened. They really should have known. Their nickname literally was UA's Curse Class A. Even better, the last time they went out as a whole group, Shigaraki had decided to surprise them like an unwanted elf on the shelf, as he used his danger hands to place a dark bruise imprint on Midoriya. Again, the class marveled at Midoriya's trouble magnet capabilities. If it weren't for the knowledge that Aizawa Sensei had already had him tested for a secondary quirk, quirk or quirk effect, they would have assumed that he really did have a quirk that attracted trouble. But enough about the possibilities on how exactly Midoriya always finds trouble. What really was a concern was whatever the hell happened in the past four hours. Once they arrived at the dorms, Aizawa Sensei had carried Midoriya up the steps to his room to place him there since the teen deserved to sleep. Something they all unanimously decided to keep silent if Midoriya ever asked, since it was a guaranteed way to get him deathly embarrassed and extremely horrified. Watching their teacher leave, the entire class found themselves rooted to the spot in the common room, all of them making quick glances around the room at their fellow classmates. It wasn't until Kaminari spoke up that the silence ended. So what the fuck was that? Kaminari, Ida reprimanded. Please refrain from vulgar language as a hero in training. Ida, dude, I understand that you only wish to help us, but seeing Midoriya do... that... Warrants a little profanity. Ida's mouth, which had been stuck open from being interrupted, promptly snapped shut. His face pinched as his moral code battled with his complete understanding of what Kaminari was referencing. It really was a surprise for them to all see Midoriya do that. It was a little jarring. Yayurozu piped from the middle of the pack. I don't, I don't even know the human body was capable of... She loosely gestured with her hand, waving in the air slightly as she trailed off. Not that she needed to even say it for them to understand. I don't think it is, kiddo. He's even has a strength augmentation quirk, doesn't he? Asui added in her usual deadpan fashion. He wasn't using it, though. Uraka added a little hesitantly. There weren't any green electricity and his eyes weren't glowing like they usually do when he does. Once more, the class was struck silent all of them questioning just how exactly Midori was capable of doing what he does. But with the person who had all the answers passed out in the next few hours, they were left with more and more questions with no answer in sight. The entire League of Villains had all stared at the computer screen that Toga had dragged into the bar that evening to show him a gif. None of them were expecting or really believing what they were seeing on the screen. Playing on loop, obviously recorded from sidelines behind a police barrier by civilian's phone, was a gif of what had happened in the weekend market. 
The news articles had only specified that it was a Yui Hira students involved, like usual, but nothing about what actually happened, so Toga went to investigate. When the insane and bloodthirsty team had come back with literal hearts in her eyes, they didn't know what to think. Whatever they did come up with, it certainly wasn't anything close to this. Tomura stared at the replaying gif, his red eyes burning holes into the screen as an unfamiliar feeling of dread did its best to crawl up his spine. He was vaguely aware of Togo waxing poetry about beauty of blood and that specific hero in training that always seemed to mess everything up. Dobby was cackling on the floor, bloody tears running down his face as his body seeked to release the emotions he was feeling but was too fucked up to cry like normal. Twice was watching Toga like she held the world in her hands and simultaneously deleted all of his video games from the save files. Compressed looked like he was incredibly amused and Kirogiri was just polishing glasses, studiously not facing the computer screen. Tomer was just stuck staring at the now viral gif of Midoriya Izuku, the hero in training Deku, and Tomer's number one pain in the ass, completely biting two fingers off of a villain that had decided to hold him hostage. The wide emerald eyes that always seemed so nervous yet so determined every time they faced down were filled with an uncharacteristic, feral energy. That set him on edge. The image only furthered the uncomfortable feeling in his gut when those eyes were paired with an animalistic action the team had taken. Suddenly, and violently, he was reminded of the time he had gone to personally visit him. He would never admit even under torture, that he felt an almost overwhelming sense of relief that he hadn't allowed his hand anywhere near that feral child's mouth. It wasn't until three days after the incident that Midoriya had explained how he was able to bite the villain's finger off. This snowballed into explaining he was a late bloomer. Thankfully, one for all stayed a secret, though Aizawa Sensei did end up dragging it out of him in private. Yagi-san had a newfound respect and fear for his co-worker after facing the feral protective side of the hero eraser head, which also led to a longer talk that ended in many tears. They were good tears. Midori had never felt as loved as he did then. If his squad decided to go extra hard on Bakugo for the next few weeks of hero practicals, then the least the teen admitted to getting better and understanding that he was in the wrong, and the anger was well deserved. Two more days after explaining everything, Midori discovered he was trending. The last move of biting the villain's finger off forever immortalized as a gif on the internet for years to come. It had sent him into a mortified hysterics. How did he find this gif set when he doesn't really use social media for anything besides Hero News updates? The Class 3 group chat had decided to use the gif as a reaction image whenever talking about something that annoyed them. Todoroki had even used the gif to explain his feelings on one of Endeavor's recent interviews on upcoming heroes in the rankings. This was so hard, and I had to record it so many different times, but I, I kind of have a mic now. It's, it's weird. <laughs>